Thank you for coming to Aimpoint Digital's anxiety-free guide to deploying Snowflake native apps. I am Christopher Marland, a Snowflake Solutions architect and a Snowflake data superhero. And my glamorous demo assistant, Brian Scally here, is a lead data engineer at Aimpoint Digital. So Aimpoint Digital is a data consultancy. We help people set up Snowflake, use Snowflake, and also do the big galaxy brain things with Snowflake. Um, and as part of that, we, we develop a lot of native apps. Either they are things we put in the marketplace, or they're more bespoke solutions that we're building. And so for that reason, we get a lot of anxiety around deployment. So we decided to get rid of that anxiety and create this framework that we're going to tell you all about so you can get rid of your anxiety. So the basics we'll cover, what are native apps? Then we'll look at the problem, deploy Zianty, the solution, very diagrammatically, it's very pretty. And then we'll go over the code and conclude. So the basics, what are native apps? Native apps are basically custom functionality that users can develop on top of Snowflake. I've used the metaphor before of uh, video game mods. So, in, but the, the difference is, is basically instead of you know, Thomas the Tank Engine dragons in Skyrim, uh, they might be machine learning models or that sort of thing. So this can be either stored procedures, UDFs, streamlit interfaces, containers as of yesterday, or all of the above. How they work is that you create an application package that has kind of all the config, all the code, all of that sort of thing. And from that, you create an application. And that application can be deployed to a, a, another, another customer's Snowflake account via either a private listing or via the marketplace. They're made up of various things. We've got the setup.sql, which is basically all the Snowflake objects that you're creating, the collection of the DDL. Then you have the snowflake.yaml file, which is where you do the configuration for the Snowflake command line, which uh, Brian will show you a bit of in a minute. Um, you then have the manifest.yml, which is more general configs, and nothing fun happens here that I've seen, but maybe, maybe, maybe it does somewhere. Um, and then we have app files. So these are other um, .sql files, .py files, all of the other bits of code that actually make up your application and are used there. But there's a problem. This isn't actually a very, very easy thing to use. And I hope no one at Snowflake is going to assassinate me for saying that. Um, there's a lot of stuff to do here. So say you make a change. A line of code has been edited. You then have to prepare to load that. Maybe you have to zip things up, ed edit a few things, get it ready to actually put in. Then you have to put it in. Maybe you're running a few command line uh, instructions. Maybe you're actually just manually uploading it on the visual interface. And then you do the code that either creates or edits the application package. And then you have to actually create the application and do all of that. It's a bit of a laborious process. And what happens next? If you are an adrenaline junkie, then you may just actually change the release directive and deploy without any testing. If you do that, you're on Santa's naughty list. That's a very bad thing to do. Um, if you're a good person, you will go all the way back and do it again, which is good but laborious. So we need to solve this, don't we? So we have CICD-ified the process. We have our, our GitHub account that has the host the repository, that hosts the code, the config, and maybe container images, all that sort of thing. And we have a dev account. The dev account is linked to a container. People develop on the container where we control the, the version of the streamlit library, for example, on all of that sort of thing. And then we can run some commands and instantly deploy changes to dev ping, 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 really, really quick. Then when we're ready, we then open a PR request that goes into our QA account. And then when that has passed, we go into our production account, which is then shared with the consumer account. So we've got three different accounts in our organization that do these various steps. 
from a Git perspective, and I think this is nice, this is a bit simpler than the splash of color we had before. We have a feature branch off the main branch, ping, ping, ping to dev as those changes are made. Um, when we actually have the app in dev, it is app name underscore username, so no one overwrites anyone's work, and there's tears, there's tantrums, there's drama. Uh, we have none of that. When we open a pull request, we then deploy to that QA account, app name underscore pull request underscore number. Again, no one's being overwritten, no one's being kablooied, torpedoed. Um, and that's where our army of testers will besiege the application and try to rip it to shreds. And once we realize that we've completely fortified it, um, we then merge into main. That pull request is approved, and it goes into prod with its, uh, its, its proper application name. Um, so that's all very, very standard DevOpsy things. Um, in terms of the technical implementation, we will go onto the solution part two and see the code. Take it away, Brian. All right. Great. You can see my VS code. So the uh, demo we're going to fly through today is basically going to show uh, the CI CD process that Chris outlined. Um, we're going to do it with one Snowflake account. I didn't create three for the demo. You're just going to have to picture that these are all going to go to separate accounts. We have dev, QA, and prod. Um, all our code for the applications are in GitHub. We have a single repository for these, and this is the structure that you can see here. I'm looking at the main branch of my uh, GitHub repo, and we're just going to go through the structure to show you what's what. We have a dev container folder. So if you're not familiar with dev containers, this is a VS Code um, feature that we use to standardize our developer environments across um, all our different developers so we can lock the versions of Python, the versions of the Snowflake CLI, everything we want to do in those environments. We have a .github folder that holds the um, GitHub action workflows that's going to do the deployment of our uh, Snowflake native app from our local machines or our remote machines into Snowflake accounts. We're not going to go look at the code there, but we're going to look at some of the output from the code um, when I run it in a bit. Then we have the apps folder, and this is where our app sits. And the demo today is going to be with an app called Quick Entry, which is an actual app that we developed at Aimpoint Digital. It's available on the marketplace if you want to check it out. Um, it's basically a UI for uh, doing inserts, updates, deletes on tables in Snowflake, more for business users than for SQL developers. Um, so this is the structure that you need to have for a Snowflake native app, right? We have an app folder. And that's basically got files that determine how the app is built on Snowflake, so the, the setup scripts that need to run um, and all the other configurations that you have there, and including a readme file. right? So this is the readme that's going to pop up when we um, initiate the app on Snowflake. And then we also have uh, other dependencies. So in this example, we have a source folder, Streamlit. We have the uh, code that will build our user interface in Streamlit that allows that app um, to be, to be functioned. Most importantly, we have this, the snowflake.yaml file. And this is what the Snowflake CLI uses to deploy a Snowflake native app from a local or remote machine into Snowflake. We did this uh, kind of towards the end of last year, and we wrote a lot of custom Python code. And it was very laborious uh, to get this working. In comes the Snowflake CLI. I think this is supported since January and replaced all of our hard work with a single YAML file. So it's extremely easy now to deploy into, uh, into a Snowflake account. So this is the structure, right? We have a boilerplate definition version for the, the YAML schema on the top. You don't really need to worry about that. And then we define some configurations for the native app itself. So we have the name, quick entry. We have the name of the stage that our local artifacts are going to get deployed into in Snowflake. We need to put those on the Snowflake account. We list the artifacts. So we're going to push all of the stuff in our app folder and all the stuff in our streamlet folder up to Snowflake. And then you can also define some configurations for the application package and the application itself, such as what warehouse is going to be used to build that, what role is going to be used to build that. It will inherit all of those things from your connection string if you don't define them here, but I'm just showing you that you, that you can do. So that's essentially it. Uh, that's the structure of the project. And we're going to just fly through the CI CD process now. So I'm going to create a feature branch off my main branch. Hit check out a new branch. We'll feature. And then we're going to just update the readme. OK, so we're now on our feature branch. And I'm going to make a change to my readme in my app folder. Let's add a line down here. Hello, Summit 2024. OK, now I might want to see how my app is performing um, on Snowflake right now. So I'm going to manually deploy that into my Snowflake dev account. So I'm just going to grab a Snowflake SQL command. 
uh, from here are Snow Snowflake CLI. So this is snow app run dash dash project. And then you point it at your app directory. So apps forward slash quick entry. I'm going to grab that, put it in my command line. And it's going to take that uh, snowflake.yaml file and do the deployment of the application up to the Snowflake dev account. And you can see here we've got to configure it configured to append my username. So quick entry package underscore Brian Scully, so that if we have multiple developers working on the same application, they're all going to have their own version of that application in development and not overwrite each other's work. So I'm going to jump over to Snowflake just to show you that this built. This is my apps uh, section in Snowflake. Let's hit refresh, and there it is, quick entry, Brian Scully. Open it up. And we can see my change. So it's relatively quick to deploy your local changes to a Snowflake account to see you know, what effect they've had. All right, so let's say we are happy with our change. Let's commit it to the branch. I'm going to make sure that branch is available on the remote. Stage my changes and add it. So update readme. And then we're going to get, go to GitHub and open up a pull request because we want to get this merged into our production code. So over in GitHub, I'm prompted here to say I have a change in my feature branch. Let's open a pull request. I'm not going to populate it here, but pretend I did. All right, so now that we've opened the pull request, our GitHub action is going to do the exact same deployment process. It's going to read that snowflake.yaml file. The only change it's going to make is it's going to append the pull request number to the name of my app and my app package so that in my test environment in Snowflake, I can directly link my version of the app to my pull request in GitHub. Right, so this job is kicked off down here. Let's just take a look at what it's doing. All right, so it's deploying the app to QA. Again, in this example, it's the same account. But you can see here it is appending the pull request and number after the application package and the application name itself. So once again, let's just jump to Snowflake, back to the app screen. Refresh, and there we have it. So there's my uh, QA uh, version of my application that my product manager, my other developers can come in, battle test, try to break it. All right, so when we're happy with that, we're going to merge it to the main branch. Right, so it's been battle tested. We're all good. Let's head back to our PR, and we're going to hit merge. And then we have a very, very similar process. It's going to do the exact same thing as the, the QA step, but it's going to deploy it, point it at the prod account. And it's also going to not include that PR number. It's just going to name those resources as they were intended to be named, so just the name of the application. So once again, let's just check our action real quick and monitor that. You can see here it's kicked off the deploy to prod job instead of deploy to QA. And it's deploying to production as just quick entry underscore package, and the application is called quick entry. And just to round it off, back to Snowflake, there is my production version of my application. So we recommend you know, following a process like this, CI CD process, get your app into a test environment, battle test it before deploying it to production. Very, very simple workflow. So I hope you find that useful. And I'll hand it back to Chris to finish off. Thank you very much. So concluding this, um, why do it this way? I think it should be obvious, but first of all, higher stakes. If you get things wrong normally in your Snowflake account, people are going to complain, but they're internal. You can ignore them, roll your eyes, uh, try and save it in your own good time. Not really, but you know. Uh, it's not as urgent. However, when you do have 100 customers all depending on it, actually, that cannot go wrong. Um, that is a sort of business critical plus. So it's really important to prevent that. Bugs are a fact of life. And sometimes in squishing bugs, you can attract bigger, scarier bugs. Um, and this whole process is, is, is very good for avoiding that. And also time. We did take a lot of effort and, and time building this. This wasn't you know, something we just rustled out um, on a whim. However, Often, front-loading the dev time in building something like this actually reduces the net time, the net effort, because you've just got a process that works a lot better. And though you're, you're, it's incremental, it does build up. It really does. So those are the reasons why we think we recommend you, you build something like this, build something similar, or ask us to build it for you. Um, and yeah, 
thank you very much. If you want to uh, talk to us in a minute, we've got uh, you know a bit more time, so we'll come down and chat. If you've got questions, oh 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 no, we got a mic. Hey, okay. Anyone any questions? I didn't realize we had the mic. Sorry. Hello. Hello. How long takes you to create the CI/CD pipeline from scratch? Um, N now, very very little. <laughs> yeah, it's a little tricky because we built it before the Snowflake CLI existed, and then it did. So we bulldozed it and started from scratch. Um, and I think the second version probably cumulatively like two weeks. Of yeah, effort. yeah, very very quickly. But um, I think since January, native app deployment has been supported by the Snowflake CLI. So now. It's very, very easy. All you need to do is have that YAML file. And if you want to do some things like change the name of the app as it's deployed to the different environments, that's just some scripts that you can use in your GitHub Actions to, to alter that um, file while you, while you push it up there. And I'm sure there'll be more features coming in the Snowflake CLI to support maybe some of that um, kind of configuration in the future. Do you have uh, comparable processes for your other types of deployments into Snowflake? So tables, procedures, et cetera, et cetera? I would say no. I mean, because we're a services company, we don't have anything that we actually run for ourselves in that same way. And I'd say if I was going to be advising, I'd say if you're doing stuff like maybe just standalone streamlit apps, maybe containerized applications, I'd say yes, build something very similar. And you'd only need to change five lines of code in this whole process to, to, to do that. Um, if you're talking more about like just DDL and RBAC, I think Git integrations, execute immediate from GitHub Action that, that runs the execute immediate from, I think that's probably a more sensible CI CD process. Um, but I'll submit that as a talk track next year. And yeah, thank you all very, very much.